Thank you for the introduction. It's really good to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Um, thanks to Nancy for all the logistical support and to Alex and to the Dean for supporting this conference and Jasper for inviting me to deliver one of the keynotes. This is my second time ever in this country. The first time was a year ago, January, for another um, CASA conference at AUB. And um, I'm really, really glad to be back. I'm enjoying it very much. Thank you for having me. Can you hear me in the back, Nadja? You can hear me. Savage sexualities, Hawaiian indigeneity and the politics of state sovereignty. In her provocative 1997 essay, Real Natives Don't French Kiss When They're Making Love, Teresia Teaiwa argues that abandoning French kissing is a radical act of indigenous decolonization. The piece begins with an account of the 1995 boycott of French products in response to then President Jacques Chirac's resumption of nuclear testing in the South Pacific Island colonies that constitute French Polynesia. Teawa links the practice of open mouth tongue kissing to the myth of Pacific Islanders as savage cannibals that Europeans used to justify colonialism. She suggests, quote, white people introduced this sucking face, French kissing, tonguing to the islands. Before, we never used to do that. We had other, much more erotic ways of expressing our passion, but that's another story. The point is, French kissing was foreign to us, end quote. She also argues the case that French kissing was used as an instrument of genocide since it furthered the spread of contagious diseases brought by white sailors. Teiwa ends the essay by advancing what she calls the Hongi principle, or how to not eat the other. Here she reminds the reader that indigenous Pacific kissing technique is all in the nose. That is, the nose press with an exchange of breath. Quote, what's important here is not eating the other person. It's breathing them in. Love is sharing the breath of life, end quote. Anticipating the skeptical reader, she uses another angle. So, you're not convinced? You still feel like you have to use your tongue? Well, if you must, then again, we can learn from the Maori who are still warriors, and when they do the haka, the most fearsome warriors do the wero. Now, as I understand it, the haka is a team in unison that postures with actions and rhythmically shouted words. Some of you may know this from the All Blacks rugby team. You've seen it. There are several types of haka. They can serve as a welcome performed for visitors and or a challenge to opponents. Among other specific gestures, the wero can consist of extending the tongue combined with the pukana, the widening of the eyes in order to impress or intimidate. Teawa concludes her piece asking and declaring, quote, you want to use your tongue? Your tongue is a weapon. Real natives don't French kiss when they're making love. Real natives French kiss when they're making war, end quote. Prior to her essay being published, I recall Teresia, it's a colleague and an old friend, telling me and several friends about this suggested act of decolonization. We were sitting in a hotel bar in Hilo on the island of Hawaii at the start of the Pacific History Association Conference of 1996. In the circle, all native Pacific Islanders were, perhaps not so ironically, sipping Hinano Tahitian beer. Well, let me tell you that while most of us were extremely intrigued by her advocating that we all seize tongue kissing to engage in a bodily practice of decolonization, none of us were pleased and some were even angry. In turn, she urged us each to try refraining from French kissing for just six months and see how we experienced intimate pleasures without it. Now, I have no idea what if anyone else took up the challenge. I have to admit that I did not. Nonetheless, I've been intermittently gripped by the suggestion ever since. In his 1929 work, Studies of Savages and Sex, British anthropologist Ernest Crawley devotes a chapter to what he calls the nature and history of the kiss. In it, he claims, quote, 
kissing as a universal expression in the social lie of the higher civilizations, of the feelings of affection, love, and then in parentheses, sexual, parental, and filial, and veneration, end quote. And that in its refined form, quote, kissing supplies a case in the higher levels of physiological psychology of the meeting and interaction of the two complementary primal impulses, hunger and love. He explains, quote, the European kiss consists essentially in the application of the lips to some part of the face, head, or body, or to the lips of the other person. Normally, there is no conscious olfactory element or any tactile use of the notes is absolutely unknown. It is thus a distinct species, and to describe it as having evolved from the savage form is erroneous." End quote. Crawley contrasts what he terms the civilized kiss with the forms of what he calls the savage kiss. Here, the lower types of the kiss include the olfactory form, which occasionally includes mutual contact with the nose, as among the Maoris, society and sandwich islanders, the Tongans, the Eskimo, and most of the Malayan peoples." End quote. Of course, the Savage Islands was the name given to the Hawaiian Islands by Captain James Cook in the late 18th century in honor of then First Lord of the Admiralty, John Montague, Fourth Earl of Sandwich. So here Crawley is talking about Native Hawaiians. And the term for Native Hawaiians that I'll be using throughout my piece uh, interchangeably with Hawaiian and Native Hawaiian is Kanaka Maoli. When I say Hawaiian or Native Hawaiian or Kanaka Maoli, I'm talking about indigenous Polynesian people to the islands, um, minority in Hawaii due to settler colonialism. For Crawley, these groups are what he calls the lower and semi-civilized races, a step above those with the typical primitive kiss which he suggests made, is made with contact of nose and cheek, right? So the nose press is semi-civilized, not the full-on savage primitive kiss. Westerners have imposed their sovereignty and claims to possession over indigenous life and land through discourses of superiority that endure well beyond Crawley's early 20th century account. A preoccupation with sexual deviance is a recurrent theme in colonial writings in the Pacific from first contact, indigenous sexualities have been consistently distorted, misrepresented, and degraded. As Lisa Kahale Ole Hall and I have written elsewhere with regard to Oceania, outsiders formed a legacy of control and commodification of sexuality. And because Pacific cultures had oral rather than written historical traditions, the written history that survives was filtered through the censorship of those literate and often horrified missionaries. This dominance in the realm of both governance and sexuality is positioned in contrast to the supposed lawlessness of indigenous peoples seen as sexual degenerates. As Anne Laura Stoller asserts, colonial and imperial authority and racial distinctions were fundamentally structured in terms of gender difference. And she further argues that sexual control was more than a metaphor for colonial domination. It fundamentally worked to mark class and racial differences and was implicated in a wider set of relations of power, where the governing and ordering of sexual relations was central to the development of particular kinds of colonial settlements and to the assigned economic activity within them. And I'll just give you one very brief example. Perhaps you've heard about uh, Barack Obama attending the private elite school called Punahou in Hawaii, where he grew up. Punho was founded by white American missionaries in the early, um, well, to the, in the mid-19th century because they wanted to segregate their children from Hawaiian children who were seen as overly sexual, right? So this is part of the colonial roots of that institution linked to a, a discourse of Hawaiian sexuality. In turn, policies of regulation, spatial separation, and access were shaped by notions of promiscuity and savagery. M. Jackie Alexander has also argued that the racialization and sexualization of morality provided the foundation upon which the identity and authority of colonialism rests. For these reasons, sex as a category of colonial control is a fundamental consideration when exploring sexuality in historical context. My aim today is to open up a generative conversation, not to make a prescriptive argument. 
I propose that any sincere examination of sexuality in relation to colonial domination necessarily entails a focus on sovereignty and the sexual implications of sovereignty. Hence, I take up Foucault's invaluable work on the problem of both sovereignty and sexuality in the West to investigate the technologies of power that deny both indigenous sovereignties and indigenous sexualities. Within the rubric of decolonization, I suggest a critical assessment of pre-colonial epistems and cultural practices. The specter of the pre-colonial is too often viewed as an assertion of an essential or primordial world evoked in a problematic bid to claim purity in the service of a retrograde and exclusive form of ethnic nationalism, not as a project of reclamation that is a form of resistance to ongoing colonial subordination. To be clear, this is not my bid for cultural purity, and I'm not suggesting the possibility of restoring a people to an original or primordial condition. As Ella Shohat writes, quote, the question is not whether there is such a thing as an originary homogenous past, and if there is, whether it would be possible to return to it, or even whether the past is unjustifiably idealized. Rather, the question is who is mobilizing what in the articulation of the past, deploying what identities, identifications, and representations, and in the name of what political vision and goals, end quote. In U.S. settler colonial society in both Native America, North America and the U.S. occupied Pacific Islands, the undeniability of indigenous societies demands an engagement with the question of the pre-colonial. Of course, what is considered pre-colonial differs across the vast stretch of imperial bounds. For example, while 1492 marks Columbus's arrival in the Caribbean, and 1620 marks the arrival of the Mayflower at Plymouth, Cook's foray in Hawaii in 1778 is the common window used to mark European arrival in the Hawaiian Islands. My presentation here examines the aspects, aspects of contemporary Hawaiian nationalism in relation to colonial discourses of savagery and the legal regulation of sexuality by indigenous elites as a response to Western imperialism. This social formation congealed within a few short decades after the establishment of the Hawaiian Kingdom in 1810, which was founded in order to secure international recognition as an independent state. Looking at the sexual implications of sovereignty, I explore the historical and contemporary consequences of disavowing indigeneity and the contradictory nature of Hawaiian political claims as international law limits indigenous self-determination. And I'll come back to that point, but I want to just dwell here for a moment because, um, is the dean still here, Patrick McGreevy? Well, he, when he laid out the, the treaty from 1492, right, and talking about the palpables in 1492, and uh, the, the treaty in 1494, this all still undergirds international law, and this is exactly what still remains today in the 21st century that subordinates indigenous self-determination. So I'll come back around to that, and I really appreciate being able to link onto his opening remarks. Here I draw from my current book in progress titled, Thy Kingdom Come, and there's a question mark after that, The Paradox of Hawaiian Sovereignty. It is about contemporary Hawaiian independence claims and activism. Now, I just have to pause here because, uh, and I'm doing this not because I'm in this region, I do this everywhere I go because I have to assume no prior knowledge about how the US took over Hawaii. And I do this in, in the United States as well because there's an erasure, an historical erasure. And that is, uh, the kingdom was founded by Kamehameha, a great chief, the great chief in 1810. You have international global recognition of Hawaiian kingdom as an independent state in the 1840s. And then for several decades by all major uh, members of the family of, of nations. And then you have in 1887, a white militia group basically subordinating King Kalakaua, who was the first non-Kamehameha in the lineage. So you have various Kamehamehas, and then it switches over to the Kalakaua dynasty. The descendants of missionaries had become uh, corporate barons, land barons, sugar barons, and they basically forced him to sign a constitution that disenfranchised the common people and also disenfranchised Asian immigrants in Hawaii and added property and uh, income qualifications for voting rights within the kingdom. I mean, you had a constitutional monarchy by 1840, but this is a constitution by 1887. 
and it's referred to as the Bayonet Constitution because he was forced to sign it at gunpoint and it basically stripped away his powers. When he died some years later, his sister, Queen Liliuokalani, Kalani, seceded the throne. And she, one of the first things that she attempted to do was actually revise the Constitution and promulgate one that was more democratic to undo the damage done by the Bayonet Constitution. And that is actually what brought about the US-backed overthrow that supported 13 white men, mostly Americans, who basically took over the monarchy and moved very quickly to try and get the US to annex Hawaii. The overthrow took place under um, President Harrison's administration. And he was out of office very soon because this overthrow took place in January 17, 1893. And soon after that, you have Grover Cleveland taking office. And instead of moving to annex Hawaii, he sends an investigator to actually look at the conditions that led to this and why the US Marines backed these local white settlers in overtaking the monarchy. In the meantime, this uh, group called itself the Provisional Government, told the US to back off, and they formed the Republic of Hawaii in 1894. And it's not until 1898 under President McKinley that the US unilaterally annexes Hawaii through a joint resolution of Congress. So not an international treaty, and not even an act of Congress, but a joint resolution, which is to say a sentiment of Congress uh, we were annexed by. And I mention this because the year prior in 1897, you actually have a treaty going before the US Senate that was uh, defeated due to massive Hawaiian opposition uh, through three prominent nationalist groups at the turn of the century in Hawaii. One is called Hui Kale Aina. The other one is called Hui Aloha Aina that had a men's branch and a women's branch. So people usually refer to them as either two or three if you're taking the, the gendered versions distinctly. And they circulated massive petitions. This work is all documented in Noi Noi Silva's brilliant book, Aloha Betrayed, which if anybody's ever going to Hawaii, and they I always get asked, what should I do there? I'm going there, I'm going on a conference. Can you give me some tips? I say, yep, go read Aloha Betrayed, and then give me a call. And I'll tell you where to eat, where the concerts are, which beaches to go to. But you have to read this book before I give you any of the hot tips. Um, and that's because she's, she's done this research based on Hawaiian language sources. And I'll talk a bit more about that. But just, again, briefly, it's hard to talk about anything with Hawaii without giving a quick Hawaii 101. When the Republic of Hawaii formed before the US took over, they banned Hawaiian language as a medium of instruction. And when the US took Hawaii in 1898, right, so the treaty was defeated in 1897 because these petitions documented over 38,000 names of Hawaiians that said, we do not wish to be part of the US in any shape or form. And the petition was in both English language and Hawaiian language, so there's no translation issues. And there were, there were 40,000, roughly, Kanaka Maoli in Hawaii at the time. And that includes those who were already racially mixed at the time, who counted as native. People had already migrated to the Pacific Northwest on the continent. But you have a vast majority. And so the US Senate couldn't get the 2 thirds majority vote because they said, these people don't want to be part of this country. And so the next year, when you have the Spanish-American War and the US takes from Spain, Guam, the Philippines, Cuba, and Puerto Rico, they just annex Hawaii anyway, right? By hook or crook, they're gonna take Hawaii because sugar was, at that time, what oil is today, okay? The other thing I'll just mark, although his treatment of Hawaii, I, have, I take issue with in terms of how he deals with the 1959 statehood issue, but there's some other uh, issues that are worth looking at in the book. There's a foreign correspondent for the Washington Post and the New York Times, Stephen Kinzer, who wrote a book called Overthrow, Regime Change from Hawaii to Iraq. And he basically looks at Hawaii setting the new paradigm for the US putting in puppet governments to do resource extraction, really about economic um, encroachment. Um, the other thing I'll just say about the language issue is that, that Hawaiian language being banned as a medium of instruction wasn't taken off the books in the state of Hawaii until the 1980s. And it's through uh, partnerships with Maori, actually, Maori sovereignty activists that helped bring about language revitalization in Hawaii. And so you see Noi Noi Silva, the scholar that wrote that book, Aloha Betrayed, that I mentioned, coming out of that movement. And so we have a cadre of scholars who are able to do Hawaiian language-based research. And it's one thing to speak Hawaiian language as it's taught in the university. It's another thing to research these documents that were written in the 19th century. And when you had the overthrow happen, there were already 70, 70, over 70 Hawaiian language newspapers at the time. So there's a massive archive in terms of, of documentation 
but still limited access in terms of people um, getting at that. And this has implications for the research on sexuality and gender because there's certain uh, corpus material that you can get a sense of, but people are really kind of going back and looking at that because these papers, many of them were run by Hawaiian nationalist groups at the time, and they documented a lot of the stories. So, for example, in Aloha Betrayed, Noi Noi Silva quotes a newspaper piece being written in, I believe it's 1874, and the writer says, we must write down all our stories so our descendants in 2010 will know what our life was like. Right, so this is part of this movement and this is part of the, the layers of, of colonization and decolonization and these research implications. Um, <clears throat> okay, so back to the book, Thy Kingdom Come, The Paradox of Hawaiian Sovereignty. My work focuses on the contemporary movement to restore the Hawaiian kingdom and the politics of land, gender, and sexuality given the history of the dual white American projects of Christianization and civilization imposed on Kanaka Maoli. This exploration is situated within broader political disputes over whether Kanaka Maoli should be claiming an indigenous position at all, given the legal, that the legal status of indigeneity both within the US and under international law is one of political subordination. This political contest is happening in the midst of a long federal legislative drive since 2000 to contain the Hawaiian sovereignty claim via a proposal titled the Native Hawaiian Government Reorganization Act that would recognize Native Hawaiians as an Indian tribe with a right to limited internal self-determination. Hawaiians in support of independence under international law oppose it. And a good number of kingdom activists are going even further by entirely dispensing with the category of indigeneity and even I, even rejecting the identity as indigenous by claiming that the Hawaiian people are not indigenous simply because they formed an independent state, the kingdom. As such, this cadre of activists view anything less than the restoration of an independent state, Hawaiian kingdom, as backward. The subtext of this discourse is that Hawaiians were somehow more civilized than other indigenous peoples and are therefore more advanced now in terms of the sovereignty claim. Indigeneity itself has historically been viewed as incommensurate with civic life because it is always already defined as pre-modern and uncivilized. Westerners have historically viewed indigenous peoples as lawless with no advanced civilization, no religion or government. And as a result, in the independence movement today, many are politically invested in tracing just how well Kanaka adapted to westernization as evidence of the capability for self-governance. And it is Hawaiian men who seem most fixated on this particular narration of Hawaiian history and state-centered legacy of political governance. My project is a critical study of state-centered Hawaiian nationalism and its attendant disavowal of indigeneity. And what I'm zoning in on are the implications for land tenure then and today, as well as gender roles and relations, and sexual norms, identities, and practices. I analyze the epistemological and ontological shift that correlates to the transformations of what I'm terming indigenous Kanaka sovereignty to the westernized Hawaiian kingdom. From 1795 to 1810, Kamehameha violently converted a Hawaiian, a Hawaiian society of multiple paramount island chiefs into a monarchy. What was initially modeled after the British monarchy had strong indigenous elements at the start, but by the 1840s became increasingly westernized. In order to gain access into the exclusive 19th century family of nations, it was also crucial that the kingdom presented itself as Christian. This was possible because conversion was initiated by the American Board of, for, of Commissioners for Foreign Missions, the ABCFM, through the first, which was the first Christian mission to Hawaii that uh, started, it left in 1819 and they arrived in 1820. And as some of you may know, this is the same year that the ABCFM opened the first American mission here in the Middle East. Christianization especially impacted the areas arenas of gender and sexuality, both of which had been cited as evidence of Hawaiian savagery. This transformation had been ongoing since 1820 when the definition of family was fundamentally transformed. 
So already there's a push for a nuclear family rather than the Ohana system, which is the extended family, multi multiple generations, and lateral kin every which way, right? The missionaries also brought their plans to teach Hawaiians new forms of appropriate sexual conduct. The laws that undergirded these new forms of connubial relationships led to multiple restrictions of Hawaiian sexual expression. A central part of my archive includes the four different kingdom constitutions, 1840, 1852, 1864, and the 1887 bayonet, as well as the, the fifth, the draft constitution Queen Liliuokalani Kalani was poised to promulgate in 1893. Additionally, I examined the Hawaiian Kingdom civil and penal codes from 1864 to 1880. In these historical legal documents, I trace the ascendancy of patrilineal naming practices, the construction of patriarchal citizenship, and the imposition of marriage. I analyzed the codes for how they criminalized a range of domestic and sexual arrangements and practices including adultery, divorce and separation, multiple partners, children born out of wedlock, questionable paternity, and brother-sister incestuous matings once held in high esteem for procreating high-ranking, chiefly offspring. I examined the implications of these changes in law for dower rights, concepts of descent, and the regulation of property, as well as land tenure and inheritance. And just to give a, a couple really quick examples, If a woman bore a child and there were two potential fathers, right, in Western society that's a catastrophe. This child's illegitimate, right, and everything depends on the, the patrilineage and the claim, the father's claim to the child as his, right, and it's a proprietary relationship. In Hawaiian society, both men were accountable for the child and the child had claims on both families, genealogies and resources and other family members. Right, what makes more sense, <laughs> right? Um, also, you had this, this issue where people either had singular partners in succession or maybe multiple partners, but when you have the missionaries coming in and devising these laws that the kingdom takes on as its own, you all of a sudden have any form of sex outside of marriage banned as illegal and it was prosecuted. It's one thing to have the laws on the books. It's another thing to actually go after people. And if you look at Sally Mary's work, Colonizing Hawaii, she has a really rich chapter using Hilo as a case study where people were actually uh, gone after. And this is the same thing around same-sex sexual practices and um, this. Whereas, you know, when you look at, at puna, the concept of the two parents, it's called punalua. Uh, and two springs, right, that there's two possibilities. Another uh, example is uh, the po'olua, where a woman could have two partners that were co-partners. This is not just for men to have, say, two wives or two women, right? So this worked uh, for, for the two genders. There's also a question of third gender, which people are still researching in Hawaii, and I'll um, get to that in just a moment, but the category is mahu, which has been alternately defined as um, a hermaphrodite or homosexual, and it's glossed in a 20th century dictionary as either. And people in, in the late 20th century said, oh, it couldn't possibly mean hermaphrodite, and they've wanted to claim it around homosexuality, and yet in everyday uh, colloquial speech, it's actually used more for a transgendered subject, or somebody born a man who lives as a woman. And then also we know from intersex studies, right, that we can't um, dis be dismissive of what we'd call, you know, the intersex subject, formerly known as hermaphrodite. Uh, in the work here, I'm outlining some basic distinctions between indigenous Kanaka sovereignty and Hawaiian kingdom sovereignty, where I document some of the implications of 19th century Hawaiian elites use of a Western model to form a state in order to shield against Western encroachment. The representation of the nation as part of civilized manhood was crucial, especially for a Polynesian brown people considered irrational, savage yet childlike, and oversexed. The acceptance of the Hawaiian kingdom by world powers necessitated an independent nation that displayed a masculine face since that served as a sign of modernity. This major reorganization of social forms to create new norms was a political strategy to fight Western racism. 
yet it necessitated a capitulation to it in the transformation of the indigenous polity, an internal war. In Society Must Be Defended, Michel Foucault argues, politics is the continuation of war by other means. He argues that from the 17th century onward, quote, the idea that war is the uninterrupted frame of history takes a specific form, the war that is going on beneath order and peace, the war that undermines society and divides it in a binary mode, basically is a race war, end quote. That is the bifurcation within European social orders, and he's talking about this within European society. His analysis of racism in the modern state focuses on internal conquests to maintain exclusions within to ensure the well-being and very survival of the social body by a protective state. As Foucault puts it, quote, this is the internal racism of permanent purification and it will become one of the most basic dimensions of social normalization. That internal enemies, excuse me, of most, excuse me, this is the internal racism of permanent purification and it will become one of the most basic dimensions of social normalization, end quote. In other words, it is within the technologies of power nurtured in the society of normalization that internal enemies will be constructed and that modern racism will be conceived. He traces the emergence of state racism to the early 19th century through the regulatory power of biopolitics. As such, politics is the continuation of war by other means, and as he argues, rights are also an extension of war. Therefore, Foucault insists that we need a way to analyze this regulatory biopower in terms other than the juridical monarchy that still characterizes Western democracies. In other words, as he put it in The History of Sexuality, Volume 1, we still have not cut off the head of the king. And here I draw on Anne-Laura Stoller's careful work on Foucault. In her book, Race and the Education of Desire, she asks why colonial context is absent from his history of a European sexual discourse that for him was central to the making of the bourgeois subject. Stoller challenges Foucault's tunnel vision of the West and his marginalization of empire by examining his treatment of race in his 1976 College de France lectures in which he theorized the relationship between biopower, bourgeois sexuality, and what he identified as racisms of the state. And of course, Stoller's book's coming out in the mid-90s when these hadn't been translated and published in English. Help! <laughs> and now I'm gonna show you a Hawaiian <laughs> sexuality film. No. Just kidding. <laughs> I guess I did because I was I was being really emphatic and putting my fist down. Okay. All right. Well, I better I better stand over here. In turn, she argues that a history of 19th century European sexuality must also be a history of race. Quote: State racism has never been gender neutral in the management of sexuality. Gender prescriptions for motherhood and manliness, as well as gendered assessments of perversion and subversion, are part of the scaffolding on which the intimate technologies of racist policies rest." End quote. Now, whereas Stoller puts select empires, right, she's working in Southeast Asia, where Stoller puts select empires back in the frame to show how colonialism was part and parcel of the sexual discourse that was central to the making of the European bourgeois subject, my partner looks at imperialism from the other direction. In the Hawaiian context of the 1840s through the latter half of the 19th century, Kanaka elites, with the assistance of former missionaries, fighting to stop Western imperialism, this is the Hawaiian elites, worked to reorganize indigenous social forms to ensure the very well-being of the social body under this, this uh, model of a protective state. I argue that this radical restructuring which transformed Hawaiian gender roles and bore down on a range of sexual practices as a protective measure was nothing short of a race war. Thus, my book project revisits Foucault's call that we execute the king as a prerequisite for decolonial imaginings of the future. And here I draw on M. Jackie Alexander's theory of recolonization and erotic autonomy as a politics of decolonization. She calls for an emancipatory practice anchored within quote, a desire for decolonization imagined simultaneously as political, economic, 
psychic, discursive, and sexual, end quote. An examination of colonial domination and decolonization, from my perspective, also necessarily entails the question of sovereignty. There are robust debates within the fields of Native American and indigenous studies about the concept of sovereignty. Some suggest it be abandoned altogether due to its Western roots. Others suggest that the term has gone from describing that singular supreme power over a body politic to a more porous term given its chain, changing meanings and deployments within indigenous contexts. This embedded notion of sovereignty opens a space to trace how the term has proliferated with many definitions and meanings. And if we have time in the Q&A, I can talk to you sort of about the theorists that are, that are duking this out in terms of these terms, and also the politics of self-determination, which some people use as an alternative, but it also has, it's so closely tied to Western sovereignty as well. So I'm happy to discuss that, but for the sake of time, I'm just sort of um, flagging these as a, as a contested terrain. Still others suggest that rather than discarding the term, we need to theorize indigenous sovereignties and how they are distinctly different from the Western concept of sovereignty. As Aileen Morton Robinson argues in an indigenous Australian context, quote, our sovereignty is embodied. It is ontological, our being, and epistemological, our way of knowing, and it is grounded within complex relations derived from the intersubstantiation of ancestral beings, humans, and land. In this sense, our sovereignty is carried by the body and differs from Western constructions of sovereignty, which are predicated on the social contract model, the idea of a unified supreme authority, territorial integrity, and individual rights." End quote. What traditional Western notions of sovereignty and sex have in common is the objectification of living entities as property, in which land is viewed and treated as an object to be owned instead of a relation to whom we owe obligations of kinship. If we acknowledge the immeasurable ways in which indigenous sovereignties entail and indeed demand a different relationship between and among the land and the people with kinship ties bound, then indigenous sexualities, at least in the Hawaiian context, probably also encompass distinctly different orientations to pleasure and intimate encounters between and among living entities. The contrast between Western constructions of sovereignty and indigenous Kanaka sovereignty has yet to be properly documented, let alone theorized, because the legacy of the kingdom overwhelms Hawaiian political genealogies. The Hawaiian terms typically used to connote sovereignty include the term ku'oko'a, glossed as independent or free, the term ea, which means life, air, breath, and can also mean to rise or to rule up, to raise up. In 1843, Kamehameha III declared the motto of the kingdom, Uamau ke'ea o ka'aina i kapono, which is commonly translated as, the life of the land is perpetuated in righteousness. As Kanaka scholar and activist Kalekoa Ke'ao Ka'eo comments on this tenet, quote, our sovereignty does not come from a constitution. The sovereignty doesn't come from a gun. The sovereignty doesn't come from arms. But in fact, the sovereignty comes from the land. So even according to our own cultural understandings, the life itself is our sovereignty." End quote. And here we see the potential of Kanaka Maoli indigeneity to undermine notions of Western state power. Indigenous law consisted of the kanavai, a law, code, rule, or edict, and kapu, the system of law setting what was taboo, sacred, or restricted, right? So the term taboo is taken from Polynesia through Cook's voyages. And, and enters the English lexicon, tapu or kapu in Hawaiian. Kapu is contrasted with noa, which means free or common. Indigenous sovereignty in the traditional Hawaiian context arguably allowed for multiplicity in terms of authority, even as pre-colonial and pre-monarchical so society was highly stratified, with chiefs known as ali'i based on both ascribed and achieved status, kaukau ali'i serving as a buffer in the success of hierarchy, right, lesser chiefs, land stewards known as konohiki, and the common people, the maka'ai nana, or eyes of the land. Indigenous conceptions of Hawaiian indigeneity are grounded in genealogical relationship to family deities known as almakua, the land is the aina, and other kanaka. The role of the chiefs was to serve as mediators between the divine and human, as Kanaka Maoli worshipped thousands of gods and demigods. The chiefs also determined the correct uses of the land, each island was ruled by a paramount chief of either gender, 
And you know, at some point we might say of any gender, but at this point it's, it's a dualistic society from what we understand. They also um, divided these islands into large sections known as Moku, and those were further divided into what's known as Okana. And each district was compo composed of wedge-shaped sections of land that followed from the mountain to the sea, what we call Ahupua'a. A similarly diverse system of land stewards emerged to administer the lands. The stewards were usually chiefs of le lesser rank, while the common people worked the land and produced for the chiefs. The Maka'ai Nana's primary affiliations were determined through territorial considerations as inhabitants of the same Ahupua'a. Because kinship was not exclusive, well-defined, tightly knit local groups with recognized leaders did not emerge. The Ali'u, their chiefs were a floating class, tenuously related to the people on the land and dependent on them for support. And I can talk more about that, but it is a hierarchical relationship, but it is one based on reciprocity. The system of common descent, and that is to say that all Hawaiians are all related, and don't say that metaphorically, that it's one, it's one group. This is different, say, than Maori, who reckon different tribes tied to voyaging waka in terms of how they got to that land. In Hawaiian, we say we all came actually from the same uh, progenitors. The system of common descent meant flexibility and mobility, given the fact that the proportion of chiefs was greater than the number of ancestral lines to which they can trace. The multitude of genealogical possibilities also made for the structural instability of the Hawaiian chieftainship since social arrangements were in constant flux. And what this meant was any time a chief was out of line, they could be pulled down because there was always another person of chiefly lineage that could take their place and would. In terms of gender and genealogy, Hawaiian kinship was and still is reckoned bilaterally through both the maternal and paternal lines. Both high-ranking Hawaiian women and men held governing positions as paramount chiefs and lesser chiefs prior to the formation of the monarchy. As Jocelyn Linekin's book, Sacred Queens and Women of Consequence, documents, women of all genealogical ranks were considered strong, autonomous within the context of the interdependent polity, as well as active agents. Historically, Kanaka women were symbolically associated with land, valued as producers of high cultural goods, held a separate domain of female ritual and social power, and were points of access to rank land and political power. And due to the formative work of another scholar, I mentioned Noe Noe Silva earlier. Uh, besides Silva, there's also this incredible work by Lili Kala Kama'elehiva, who's a Hawaiian professor at the University of Hawaii. Due to their formative work, we can now identify strong female roles within Hawaiian cosmological traditions and among deities and chiefs in Hawaiian society. And again, that's due to the research uh, based on Hawaiian language sources. Hawaiians had a range of models of gender and sexual diversity. For example, one traditional way of, reg of Hawaiian way of registering interest in an enduring intimate relationship was called avaiulu, to bind securely, fasten, or tie, or ho'au, to stay until daylight. The intimate relationships between kane, men, and wahine, women, are sometimes referred to in the literature as marriage, but that term does not correspond to Kanaka relationships. Both men and women were autonomous in all conjugal relations. From the historical research of Kama Elihiva, it is also clear that bisexuality was normative and that both polygamy and polyandry were also not uncommon. In addition, there are also distinct categories of same-sex sexual relationships, such as the Aikane, a male lover of an Ali'i Nui male chief. There are also Mahu, that I referenced earlier, alternately defined as homosexuals, and hermaphrodites, those whom we now refer to as intersex subjects. And again, we still don't know enough about that term in the Hawaiian vernacular. Mahu is typically described, used to describe someone who is transgendered female or also used uh, as an, for an effeminate gay man. And then there's the punalua that I mentioned, spouses sharing um, a spouse, such as two husbands of a wife or two wives of a husband. The reformation of these practices was central to the 19th century Western civilizing process where the bourgeois family was the model to be emulated and by which Euro-American laws redefined Hawaiian masculinity to include ownership and control over property, including land and eventually women and children. The impact of Western laws and culture in Hawaii entailed a radical restructuring of the status of women starting in 1820 when the New England missionaries introduced Christianity. In her book, Paths of Duty, 
Patricia Grimshaw documents how the missionary women complained about Hawaiian women in their diary entries because they were frustrated with indigenous women's resistance to their lessons on how to be subservient to men. The missionary women institutionalized their own norms through modern institution building. And Calvinism and the common law of coverture were two primary determinants of Hawaiian women's shifting status. Male prominence manifested itself in the Western political structure of the kingdom, which eventually came to degrade women's status. As mentioned earlier, the monarchy was established by 1810, when through the course of approximately 15 years, Kamehameha violently transformed a Hawaiian society of multiple paramount island chiefs into a single monarchy, and that's with Western gun power um, backing. Upon his death in 1819, his son, Liho Liho, officially inherited the throne, becoming Kamehameha II. But Kamehameha I's uh, wife, if you will, Queen Ka'ahumanu, um, who was involved with him and then became involved with his son, uh, who was not her own child, uh, had no intention of allowing Liho Liho to become the sole ruler. And she became the first Kuhina Nui of Hawaii, which was a new political category created uh, for a co-regent. Hence, Kamehameha II was forced to take on a ceremonial role while she claimed administrative power for herself. Kamehameha II is best remembered for the breaking of the ancient kapu system of religious laws. And so that happened in 1819, right before the missionaries come in. And that's a really important thing, is that people had already, at least the, the nascent state had already condemned the ancient uh, laws. And the first Christian missionaries arrived only a few months later. By 1840, Kamehameha III promulgated the kingdom's first constitution that asserted a Christian nation to protect the common people from power abuses of the chiefs under one law for both. He voluntarily relinquished his absolute powers and attributes by promulgating a constitution that recognized three grand divisions of government. The king as the chief executive, the legislature, and the judiciary. He also required the formal agreement of the female premier to validate his official acts. The Privy Council and legislative body numbered among its members nearly as many female chiefs as male chiefs. But just five years later, by 1845, the kingdom government became more exclusively male when kingdom law merged married women's civic status with their respective husbands, whereby they lost the legal right to alienate or dispose of property. This coincided with the missionary descendants' pressure on King Kamehameha III to privatize communal land, the communal land tenure system, which led to what is known as the 1848 Mahale Land Division. This was a major phase of westernization for the monarchy and one of the most devastating transformations in the society in terms of its effects on the common people. And I should just pause here for a moment. Um, in the book, I'm actually going to be sort of opening with Kamehameha III as a prominent historical figure and, and in a sense uh, taking his story as an allegory for what happens in many ways to the people as a whole even though he's, he's a monarch and he's exceptional in that sense. And that is because it, he had the longest reign out of any of the monarchs and it's under his rule that you had this intense westernization and he's imposing all these laws under his own sovereign authority and yet he had a male lover. He also had an incestuous brother sister chiefly mating with his sister. And so he's in, this, he's in this old system as a high-ranking chief who's also imposing these new laws. And there's a struggle over that. There's a real deep struggle over that. And also the way he died, I think, um, is related, maybe related to that. He died, uh, as I understand it, from alcoholism. The massive change in land tenure increased the wealth of these same foreigners who managed to secure vast extensions of land as property and in turn, white settlers' presence and power increased on the islands throughout the 19th century, and Anglo-American legal impositions transformed Hawaiian society throughout that period, making for a distinct form of colonialism. And this was accompanied by global movements of capitalism and Christianity that, effect, that affected the everyday lives of Hawaiians. However, issues of genealogical rank determined Hawaiian women's status in ways where gender subordination was not clear-cut. And so even as the ideology of male dominance came to characterize the laws in face of the monarchy, women's local status and authority in relation to men's did not change substantially, at least not among the common people. And I think that this is, what, this is why you have common day memory in terms of, of this local agency in terms of the common people. Today we see this history playing out in complex ways in relation to Kanaka Maoli struggles over the status of indigeneity.
Contemporary assertions of Hawaiian sovereignty are centered on the monarchy and typically stop short of reclaiming Kanaka Maoli indigeneity. I suggest this is because it is too often viewed as a source of dispowerment, since it is tied to political subordination vis-a-vis -vis US state power in the form of congressional plenary authority over Indian tribes. And I can address that more in the Q&A if people are unfamiliar with the tribal nation model under the US federal system. In this case, the power of indigenous sovereignty is obscured precisely because it was the distancing from the formation that enabled the Kanaka Maoli people to assert sovereignty for a recognized independent state. As referenced earlier in the nationalist movement, some kingdom activists are going even further by entirely dispensing with the category of indigeneity. In this logic, Hawaiians are not indigenous and therefore not domestic dependent nations because of the 19th century existence of the kingdom. They maintain that the category is, by definition, complicit with legal notions of political dependency vis-a-vis -vis both the US government and its policy on Native Americans and within the limited rights of indigenous peoples as delineated in the Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples passed by the UN General Assembly in 2007. And I can talk about that more in the Q&A. Okay, well, keep moving. You're saying time or finish? Okay. Okay. States continue to impose this notion of the pre-modern savage as a mechanism of control in their negotiations with indigenous people's legal status and land rights. One result is that there's no global census that indigenous peoples have the right to full self-determination under international law, which would allow for the development of nation states independent from their former colonizers like post-colonial states. Because the basic criteria defines colonies under international law includes foreign domination and geographical separation from the colonizer, Indigenous peoples have been at a disadvantage in terms of application of decolon decolonization protocols. This limitation reflects the long-term battle over whether indigenous peoples should be considered peoples in the context of chapter six of, excuse me, chapter 11 of the UN Charter of 1945. Even after the passage on the Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, there is no consensus and the document itself is contradictory. Moreover, some even argue that Hawaii was never colonized because it was never really a colony, and therefore they assert that decolonization is a misnomer. And this is their rebuttal to the 1960 UN Protocols for Decolonization. Um, I can talk in the Q&A about the 1959 statehood and how Hawaii was removed from the UN list of non-self-governing territories where it was placed in 1946. In this contemporary political moment, these particular activists see Hawaii as merely occupied by the United States. And instead of UN decolonization protocols or indigenous rights um, declaration, they instead rely on the laws of occupation, the international treaties negotiated at the first and second peace conference at The Hague. Of course, the militaristic analysis of occupation is cleaner and much easier than dealing with the messy and complicated legacy of colonialism, especially settler colonialism. One could suggest then that the rejection of indigenous identity is an attempt at seeking relief from the political condition of indigeneity. In this configuration, Western nations are seen and treated as rational, strong, worldly, independent, and active, while indigenous peoples occupy the supposedly female role as savage, weak, domestic, dependent, and passive, and treated as such. Such distancing and logic entails the feminization of indigeneity in relation to masculine estates. Ironically, these notions of what is considered female are Western, which is to say that in pre-colonial Hawaiian society, women were not viewed or treated as weak, dependent, or passive. Hawaiian leaders today, like elites back then, are perpetuating that internal war, a political war over what sovereignty should look like. And yet there is a paradox. While the historical recognition of the kingdom is what enables the enduring claim to restore independent statehood, that legal genealogy is riddled with a history of indigenous denigration and criminalization. There is also a problem in that of the relationship between Western sovereignty, which is hegemonic around the globe, of course, and the way that it is an obligatory passage point to independence. The race war continues on multiple fronts, and some of us are fighting it like savages, including me. Given the layers of history and foreign intervention, there is no clear or easy way to resolve this multifaceted sovereignty question and the mirrored claims, especially so long as the US government continues to dominate the globe with its political and military power. The history of occupation and settler colonialism has generated a variety of legal options and none seem sufficient in dealing with this complicated historical legacy in a way that promotes restorative justice. 
The federal recognition legislation does not take into account the unjust occupation or overthrow of the monarchy inflicted by the U.S. government. At the same time, relying on presently existing international law regarding indigenous peoples also has the limitation that in its present state still gives priority to existing states and puts the pre-existing rights of indigenous peoples on the back burner. While this may change, for the moment, neither of these options provides Kanaka Maoli with the satisfaction of recognizing the previously independent status. The deoccupation model, while taking account of this independent status, also denies colonialism. So the recognition of previous sovereignty for the kingdom currently rests on the denial of settler colonialism and internal forms of, colonial, of domination. And although Kanaka Maoli constituted the majority of kingdom subjects prior to the 1893 overthrow, both Kanaka Maoli and other kingdom heirs together are in the demographic majority when it comes to Hawaii's current population. This begs the question as to how the kingdom government would be restored in the case that pursuing independence opened up as a feasible political goal, since minority-led governments are currently viewed as unacceptable. Settler colonialism is a structural condition that cannot be remedied by deoccupation. This situation demands an approach that is not state-centered in order to fully explore outside the confines of state sovereignty. But there is a serious predicament in doing so since the U.S. government would be happy to see the independence movement relinquish its claims. In other words, while Hawaiians may still have not cut off the head of the king, it is clear that the U.S. is trying to behead the Hawaiian kingdom. Hence, I am not suggesting that Kanaka Maoli simply abandon the claim to independent statehood. The claim itself may not be vi viable or even desirable, but it is an important one with which to wage battle against U.S. empire especially since the U.S. government, if ever pressed by the world community, cannot substantiate its claim to the Hawaiian Islands, since the archipelago was never ceded through treaty or conquest. Still, the outstanding national claim for independent statehood of the kingdom under international law exhibits a contradiction with perceived notions of what is reasonable or possible. It, too, is paradoxical in that the argument for the restoration of Hawaii's independence is based on acceptable premises and valid reasoning all while the conclusion is typically viewed as logically unacceptable. This claim seems absurd, but only because of U.S. global domination. It is a proposition that is grounded in the rule of law, but regardless, most people dismiss the independence claim as ridiculous because the Hawaiian people, or the kingdom at least, is considered retrograde at best and conquered at, at worst. I mean, who wants to reestablish a dead monarchy in the 21st century during the calls for global democracy? In this logic, the promise of indigenous Hawaiians securing domestic dependent status, like Indian tribes, seems like a really good deal, certainly better than nothing. Yet this, the proposed tribal model for Hawaiians is a U.S. government-driven solution to the so-called Hawaiian problem. Despite attempts by state officials to contain the outstanding Hawaiian sovereignty claim within U.S. federal policy, the claim to Hawaiian independence remains unextinguished and is still playing out. However, the claim is meaningless if there is nothing left to reclaim. Those active in the Kingdom Royalist movement draw on histories of Kingdom sovereignty which are gendered in complicated ways and also have deep ramifications for sexual politics. The issue of land is also still central as the 1.8 million acres of Kingdom Crown and Government lands divided in that 1848 Mahale I referenced earlier, those have never been sold or privatized, not yet anyway. However, the current 1959 50th state government in Hawaii is now planning to sell these seized lands since this is some of the most expensive real estate in the world. Having outlined these changes, and I am wrapping up, where do we go and how does this all relate to my opening discussion of French kissing, colonialism, and decolonization? I want to return in conclusion to Te Awa's assertion that real natives don't French kiss when they are making love. They French kiss when they are making war. If we accept Foucault's argument that rights are an extension of war, then where does that leave us? Does one have to give up French kissing to be a real native? Is my tongue kissing evidence of my colonization? If I continue to tongue kiss, am I perpetuating war? What if I refuse to use my tongue while waging war? Do I cede the invention of tongue kissing to the French? The answer is not definitive. Of course, it is in the discourse. Whereas Teawa has identified this act as French practice, for her it constitutes a colonizing act when used in the name of love. I myself question whether tongue kissing is a French or any Western form or colonial imposition and therefore do not see it as colonizing. But even if there is evidence that open mouth tongue kissing was not a foreign practice, what that activity meant should not be assumed. 
Nayan Shah, in his work on the politics of contemporary South Asian queers, has written about how the searching for an indigenous tr tradition and forms of reclaiming the past raises epistemological questions about what constitutes history. He also warns against the presumption that sexuality is a definable and universal or trans historical activity. And he flags this problem in recovering the past for those hoping to secure their identities is timeless. This also means that what constitutes making love cannot be assumed then or now. Although there is more to learn about Kanakamali bodily pleasures, I do know that the nose press hongi, or in Hawaiian we say honi, uh, the Hawaiian specific term for what other people call the nose press, was a greeting. So I figure that while the honi could be widely offered, tongue kissing perhaps was not, or at least was not used as a welcome. Although Te Aiwa was prescriptive in her published piece, in person at least, she proposed a trial run for us to give up French kissing for just six months and see how we experienced intimate pleasures without it. I am all for experimenting but think the potential pleasure found in tongue kissing, at least with someone who knows how, is worth holding on to regardless of the origins of the practice. I would no sooner permanently give up tongue kissing than I would give up writing even though ancient Hawaii was an oral society. In other words, I find the uses of pleasure, a la Foucault, enabling in relations of power, a potentially sustaining practice, and sustenance for supple decolonization. Whereas kingdom royalists tend to conceive of indigeneity and state dependency as, as a state of dependency and domesticity, I argue it is actually a fluid source of dynamic power, molten that is the very source of kanaka, not kingdom sovereignty. Hence, my focus on colonialism transformed Hawaiian land tenure, gender, and sexuality to explore decolonization under the current political conditions for the consideration of indigenous frameworks for land reclamation, gender autonomy, and sexual agency. Thank you.